So I hope you see my slides now. Yes, works now, perfect. Okay. okay. Yeah, thanks. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to, uh, uh, to uh, present my work today in this uh, seminar. Um, yeah, so today will be about mismatching clocks. And as uh, Anna already introduced, I did my postdoc uh, at McGill University in laboratory of uh, Diane Brappa and Nicolas Sarmakian. And my talk today will be mainly about the work I did in their lab. So since um, yeah, since two years, I've been back in Leiden at the, uh, in, the, in the Netherlands, where I'm uh, yeah, sort of establishing my research line on circadian medicine and clinical chronobiology. But um, yeah, today I will pre present the work I did at McGill. Um, and hopefully the other topic will come uh, at another point. Yeah, so just the outline of my talk. So I will start with an introduction. Um, and then, yeah, there are four main topics I would like to, uh, to present to you today. So I'm very interested in how, um, yeah, physiology adapts to circadian misalignment or how, yeah, what are the physiological effects of circadian misalignment. And as a model, we use night shifts. So I will talk about how peripheral circadian rhythms uh, adapt in response to night shift. The, I'll discuss the degree of inter-individual friability, the effect of bright light as a sort of synchronizing uh, stimulus perhaps, and um, also about the adaptation of peripheral rhythms in the response to actual night shift work. So both a combination of laboratory studies and field studies. So first, I would like to zoom out a bit. So well, this is the earth rotating on its axis. And well, life evolved on this planet, of course. So um, it evolved under bright days and dark nights. And this might sound trivial to a general audience, maybe not to you, because we know that um, actually physiology and behavior of all organisms um, yeah, evolved in these circumstances and therefore have adapted uh, to these cycles. So most organisms have evolved a circadian clock, which is an adaptation to daily changing in the environment. So it allows organisms not only to respond to predictable changes in the environment, but also to proactively anticipate them. And the way the system works is um, uh, yes, via a central clock that's in the hypothalamus, in the uh, two very small nuclei, I made a typo, um, called the, the suprachiasmatic nuclei in the, uh, uh, yeah, so in the brain. Uh, and that coordinates um, the peripheral clocks that are in actually all other tissues that you uh, can think of. So uh, other brain areas, but also muscle and liver and heart. They all have peripheral clocks. And together these orchestrate circadian rhythms in well almost any physiological process you look at. So for example, uh, neurotransmission and synaptic activity, um, but also endocrine system and metabolism and the immune system, they all show um, circadian rhythms allowing the body to adapt to the changes in the environment. So for example, in feeding and fasting and in sleeping and waking. So what's important to know is that the circadian rhythms have an endogenous nature. And the way this was first discovered in, um, in, uh, in humans, sorry, I'm adding a pointer. Uh, yeah, so the way this was first discovered in uh, humans was in bunker experiments in the 60s by Jürgen Axel. Uh, Germany. Um, yeah, so what you can do in a bunker is, is completely devoid of uh, time cues, so there's no light, no changes in temperature, so you can really study the endogenous nature of circadian rhythms. And what you can then see in a normal light-dark cycle where people are entrained uh, to, to this, so they sleep during the, during the night and are awake during the, the light period. And then when people are in a constant environment, such as in a bunker, um, sleep starts progressively uh, later in most people because the endogenous period of the circadian system is a little bit uh, longer than 24 hours. And also physiological processes such as, for example, core body temperature will shift according to this endogenous nature of the circadian rhythms. So still in constant environments, there is what we call a circadian rhythm, so an approximately 24 hour rhythm in um, behavior and in physiology. So on a molecular level, how is the system regulated? So, um, yeah, so what is known is that uh, there's a transcriptional translational feedback loop that takes place in uh, every cell in the, in the body, consisting of transcription factors that drive the transcription of uh, certain genes. They are uh, transcribed, translated, they move back to the nucleus, and they inhibit the activity of these transcription factors, um, thereby also repressing their own uh, 
their own transcription. And this creates a loop of approximately 24 hours. Um, and it's really the basis for all the, the circadian rhythms that are observed in, uh, in these physiological processes. Yeah, so this, yeah, so by, by this, all of these genes, they show a 24 hour or circadian rhythm, not only in the SCN, so in the supervised nucleus, but also in other tissues such as the liver and the lung and the pituitary gland. Um, there's a very nice oscillation every 24 hours. So what's important is that there, yeah, so there's this, this loop of, of clock genes, as we call them, but these um, transcription factors, they also control the expression of so-called clock controlled genes. And as a result of this, um, many genes are actually under, under circadian control. And as a result, hundreds of genes in any given tissue you look at uh, show a circadian rhythm. So here you can see a heat map and every little line is, uh, is a different gene that is expressed. Um, and you can see over the time of day, the waxing and waning levels of, uh, of, of different transcripts. So in any given tissue, five to 10% of all genes are and show a circadian rhythm. And then, so what's also important is that, well, transcription is nice, but there's uh, genes or transcripts, so mRNA is translated into proteins. And then sort of the functional output of that is, um, yeah, it's biochemistry, so biochemical pathways that are regulated then also in a circadian fashion, also in humans. So different metabolites, um, so for example, amino acids and azocarnitins and glucose, also show 24 hour uh, or circadian rhythm in humans. So then the question is, um, and so what's important to, uh, to realize is that all these different processes are, so they have an endogenous nature, but they are also influenced by the environment. And my research sort of looked into the interaction between the environment and these different sort of levels of the regulation of the circadian system as a whole. And this environment has drastically changed in the past decade. So if you think about it, there's uh, now a lot of shift work. Um, many people suffer from sleep deprivation. There's a lot of disease and uh, more, more an aging population. Altered feeding patterns. Uh, people spend a lot of time indoors. There's social jet lag. There's exposure to light at night. So the environment really has changed. And this also provides conflicting cues to the circadian system. So there might be a state of, uh, of circadian yeah, disruption, as we call it, because of all these factors. So a large part of the population can be affected by this. And so in, in well, my previous lab, we used a shift work as a model for circadian misalignment. And this is yeah, sort of an, an ectogram of a shift worker. Uh, so each line is a day, and you can see the activity in gray of this person. So when the person is active a lot and walking around, there's a lot of gray. And during sleep in blue, um, there's a uh, little activity. And in the colors, I thought I had a legend. In colors, you see when this person was working. So this is a night shift worker, actually a rotating shift worker. So this person has evening shifts here in red. Um, this person can sleep until very late. Also night shifts. Uh, well, this person is working during the night and then trying to sleep during the day. And very early morning shifts where the participant has to wake up very early in the, uh, in the morning. So, well, you can see that this, of course, leads to a yeah, very uh, irregular sleep pattern where during morning shifts, people sleep, try to sleep very early and have to wake up very early. During evening shifts, uh, the sleep is uh, yeah, very much shifted. And also during night shifts, it's even shifted even later. And we also looked at feeding behavior, which is also shifted, uh, uh, of course, especially during night shifts when eating takes place during the night. So thereby shift work is really an extreme case of what we call circadian misalignment. And really it's a big challenge for the circadian system because it expects to be sleeping during the night and for example, eating and active, being active during the day. And this is completely shifted in night shift work. And therefore we use it as a model to study uh, circadian misalignment. Yeah, so why do we study this? Well, there's um, a lot of adverse health effects that are associated with circadian misalignment. And this partly comes from epidemiological studies in shift workers, but also uh, controlled laboratory studies, um, where it's shown that a disrupted clock is related to, for example, poor sleep quality, depression and mental health, but also cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, a bigger risk of um, type 2 diabetes, for example, and fatty liver disease. Um, 
yeah, so really also from a public health point of view, it's, it's important to really understand the, the mechanisms behind this. And what's an important point, I think, and this is work by Dombey Frank Scheer in Harvard, is that these health effects already arise um, after a few days, so very acutely. So this was a controlled laboratory study where they studied um, healthy participants uh, in a forced desynchrony protocol. So this is a protocol whereby people are on a 28-hour schedule um, and the sleep and uh, the meals are, are distributed on this 28-hour schedule. So at some points during this protocol, people eat during their regular times and during other um, for example, for 28 hour days later, the breakfast now takes place at previous dinner time. And what you can see is in such a misaligned uh, state, for example, the glucose response in response to a meal is much bigger in the misaligned condition compared to the aligned condition. And also insulin responses are, are very different. And so, it, yeah, even in such an acute, uh, acute way. We are what we were interested in is what is the effect of circadian misalignment um, uh, on the molecular regulation of circadian rhythm. So I showed you this before. There's the, the, the transcriptional translation of feedback loop with the clock genes. There's the transcriptome and the metabolome that are regulated on, in a circadian uh, fashion. So what is then the effect of circadian misalignment on this? So we yeah, I sort of summarized it like, like this. So this is a, still an empty table. And during this presentation, I will fill it up um, as we go along. The first question we ask is, um, uh, yeah, how do these different rhythms at these different levels adapt to simulated night shifts? So, yeah, so we use the simulated night shift protocol in eight healthy uh, participants, so young uh, male and females. Um, and so, what this protocol consists of is a baseline day during which um, there was, uh, yeah, sleep was scheduled on their during their normal. Um, sleep and wake times, so in this case from midnight to 8, but other participants maybe from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. And during the first 24 hours on this protocol, we would collect blood samples. They would then be subjected to yeah, what we call simulated night shifts, so it basically means that we shift their sleep uh, to, the, um, to the day and they have to stay awake during the night. And then on the fourth day on this schedule, the, uh, we take blood again for 24 hours every two to four hours to keep blood samples during this protocol. We can compare a baseline to the night shift condition and see what is the effect of um, yeah of the shift in the uh, in the sleep and in the in the feeding. Yeah so first of all we looked at melatonin. So melatonin is a marker for the central circadian clock. So it's a hormone that's produced by the pineal gland and it's high normally during the night and low during the day and it's yeah it's a well established marker for the, the central circadian clock. So this was um, a postdoc in the lab before I joined to, uh, who, uh, uh, yeah, who collected these data. And um, yeah, so what you can see is that at baseline, as we expect, melatonin levels are high in these participants uh, during the night and then during the day it's very low. And also in this night shift condition, so after four days on, in the simulated night shift, still melatonin is high during the, uh, during the night and low during the day. So this means that so this shows the, the, the phase shift is only 13 minutes. So that means that even though the sleep now is scheduled during the, during the day, the melatonin rhythm has not adapted uh, to this. So we can say that the central clock did not adapt to the simulated night shift protocol. So we also collected, um, yeah, so we collected blood samples and we also determined, uh, we isolated the PBMC, so the, the peripheral blood mononuclear cells that are uh, part of the, yeah, that are in this in the blood, and we can um, determine clock gene expression and transcriptomic. Uh, we can do transcriptomic analysis on these. So to look at a peripheral clock and also the output of the peripheral clock for the clock control gene expression. And so what we saw again, this was by the, the previous postdoc in the lab, who showed that so these are the different uh, clock genes. Um, they yeah, so they show a nice 24-hour uh, rhythm and in the night shift condition, what you can see is that the, yeah, maybe the rhythms are a little bit blunted, but they also peak at a similar time uh, compared to the, to the baseline condition. So also showing that these uh, peripheral clock gene rhythms did not adapt to the night shift schedule. So the, also the phase shift, as you can see here, is very, uh, is very limited. 
Yeah, so then, so next step, we looked into the transcriptome, so all the clock control genes that are in the, uh, that are also expressed by these PBMCs. So we had information about 12,000 uh, transcripts. And what we, um, yeah, so how we analyzed these data is by using differential rhythmicity analysis. Um, so this basically is a model selection approach to directly compare rhythmic parameters between conditions. So we compared model fits, for example, to classify transcripts in different categories. So there might be transcripts that have the same rhythmic parameters. So if they do not adapt to the night shifts, then we will see this pattern. Um, Rhythms might have shifted, or it might be a rhythm at baseline, but not at the base, at uh, night shift condition, or the other way around. Um, Laura, sorry, I have to introduce you quickly. Um, we, we have some difficulties understanding you. Um, there might be some internet problem or maybe some background noise. Um, it, it sort of goes up and down a bit, so sometimes we can hear you quite well, and then, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what I can do about it. Uh, is it really bad? No, I think it. So it's okay. It's just sometimes. So if if there's nothing uh, much you can do about it, then I think we just continue. Yeah, maybe uh, something. I might have my hand on the on the microphone. Yeah, maybe. maybe maybe it's something like that, or you just get closer to your microphone or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Let me know if it if it's if it's better or worse. Okay. Yeah, I I'll, I'll get back to you. Thank you. Yeah, so we use the model selection ap approach to categorize transcripts in different uh, categories. Um, so I will show you the results um, later. But what I also want to point out is that there is um, have been recent R packages to also do this differential rhythmicity analysis. So I put them here, but just for your reference, because I think it's a it's a good method to uh, to analyze data. Yeah, so here I show the summary of the classification of of transcripts. Um, and so what you can see is that the largest group of transcripts, they were rhythmic at both at baseline and during a night shift condition. And so what's very striking, if we look a bit closer at these, most of them belong to this category where, um, uh, yeah, where the rhythm had not shifted uh, during base or during the night shift condition compared to the baseline. So, um, yeah, so what it shows is that almost 75% of transcripts that are rhythmic at baseline, they remain rhythmic with similar phase and amplitude. So is my sound better now or? Yeah, I think so. Thanks. Okay, okay. Good. Yeah, so if we look a bit more closely at these transcripts that uh, show a similar rhythm, so here's again a heat map, so each line is, is a transcript, and you can see high expression in red and low expression in blue. Um, yeah, you can see that for these different transcripts, they are really, they are rhythmic at baseline and during the night shift. And then we did something called phase set enrichment analysis, which is basically a way to sort of, um, yes, based on these different transcripts that are rhythmic, we can um, see what, um, uh, what physiological processes they belong to, and I sort of see when these physiological processes are um, uh, yeah, yeah. So when these when these transcripts speak and what these physiological processes, uh, or what physiological processes they belong to. So what you can see is that, for example, the transcripts related to the immune system they peak um, mainly here at night and also sometimes here during the day. Um, but for example, transcripts related to metabolic processes they are more active here during the uh, during the during the day. Um, and so on for other um, for other transcripts. So what it shows is that during the night shift condition, now the transcripts that are related to these processes now peak at the time. Um, yeah, that might be less beneficial for the for the physiology because now the eating and other processes have, or other environmental cues have shifted, but the endogenous regulation um, of physiology still peaks at at the at the previous time points. So there's sort of a loss of temporal coordination of these physiological processes with the external environment. So then the next um, thing we looked at was at the um, at the metabolome. So again we used the same uh, yeah it was the same protocol. 
Um, but now we looked at the metabolomics. We also determined this in the blood samples, so in the, in the plasma. And so metabolomics provides a yeah, sort of a, a biochemical readout of, um, of the body, and it, it can show the response to different, uh, for example, nutritional challenges or other challenges, um, and also to uh, the stadium misalignment. So in the metabolomics panel we used, there were acylcarnitins, um, amino acids, organoacids, uh, lipids, um, also glucose, so that's the one monosaccharide here in the table. Um, so we could look at all these um, at all these metabolites and see what the response was to the night shift. So what we um, yeah so again this is a heat map of the different different metabolites that showed a, a significant twenty four hour rhythm in these uh, um, yeah during the baseline condition and during the night shift condition and in uh, bold I clicks are the ones that are shared between those conditions so they're rhythmic in, in both conditions. And so what we saw when we look closer at those yeah, two we actually saw that most of the metabolites were uh, classified as behavior influenced rather than circadian influenced. So there's two examples of each here. So for example, there's C6, which is an acylcarnitin, um, which reflects my, uh, mitochondrial function. And you can see that it's uh, actually shifted. Where, and also alanine, it, so it peaked during the night. Um, yeah, it peaked during the night and uh, so during the sleep and also uh, yeah. it peaked during the night or it peaked during the sleep in the uh, during the simulated night shift work. Um, and there were fewer metabolites that were called circadian influence that really kept their endogenous uh, or that kept their their rhythm with the same phase as uh, as previously. Yeah, so what we so what we showed is that the majority of metabolites uh, are influenced by behavioral cycles, and that's also in line with what um, the group of Deborah found in 2018. Uh, so they also had a simulated night shift protocol, a little bit different than our protocol, um, and they also found that 95% of all metabolites that they um, analyzed um, were driven, or the rhythms were driven by um, uh, by by behavioral time cues rather than the endogenous circadian system. So now if we look at the, the summary for now, um, do rhythms at these different levels adapt to the simulated night shift? Well, not, that's not the case for the central clock, not the case for the peripheral clock, and not the case for the transcriptome, but the metabolome seems to, uh, seems to adapt. So next question we looked at is the inter-individual friability, because so far I only showed you um, results on the um, uh, on the group level, but I think it's also very interesting to see, yeah, what does this mean for an individual uh, person? So I, I looked at those. Um, so here's just an example of what the data looks like on an individual level. So here are some transcripts at the baseline level, um, and each color represents a different participant. Um, yeah, what you can see is that different that this transcript shows uh, rhythms um, here a little bit more chaotic and in this case uh, quite synchronized across the, the participants. And also for the metabolites, there's sort of a similar picture at least with these examples. So some metabolites are very coordinated between participants uh, during baseline and during night shift condition, and others it's a bit more messy. So there are rhythms on an individual level, but not on a uh, um, but on a group level, this is then absent. Yeah, so to systematically look at this, because of course we have a lot of transcripts and a lot of metabolites. So to systematically approach this inter-individual friability, I looked at each participant and at each transcript. I, and we determined the um, acrophase during baseline, the acrophase during a night shift of, um, of this transcript. We calculated the phase shift, so the, the echophase of the baseline minus the echophase of the night shift, and we repeated this for all participants and transcripts in this case. And so what you get are images like this. So these are plots for individual participants, um, and each little dot here is a transcript. So it's the phase shift of a transcript um, within one participant. And what you can see is that in general, the phase shift during the simulated night shift schedule is very limited. So, and it's also very, um, yeah, there's a very 
small variation between participants actually. So um, it seems that in general transcripts um, uh, minimally shifted also on an individual level. So like we saw on the group level, we also see on the uh, on the individual level. For metabolites, we see something different. So we saw that most or on a group level metabolites, they are driven by behavioral cycle. But if we look on an individual level, this is uh, very different. So looking at, um, there's a wide range of variability between these phases. So um, they're clustered within the individual. So for example, in this individual, most metabolites, they, well, they are clustered around zero. So showing no phase shift, um, whereas in, in um, this person, there's a six hour, uh, a six hour advance. And but it's high low, highly heterogeneous between individuals. So there's a 0 0.2 hour delay to a 12 hour advance in these participants. Yeah, so then again, summarizing. So we see um, yeah, small degree of inter-individual variability uh, for the transcriptome, but a large inter-individual variability for the uh, metabolome. Yeah, so what we were also interested in is the response to bright light. So um, yeah, so the reason we were interested in it is in this is because we know that bright light has a large effect on a central clock. Um, so, for example, if you look at melatonin phase shifts uh, after a pre-cycle five-hour light stimulus uh, in young adults, so this was work done in the group of Jamie Seiter, um, you see, uh, for example, at high light intensity, you see a very large phase shift, and that's also very consistent between participants. Um, but so what about peripheral circadian rhythms? There's not much known about, and we were interested in, in this. So for this, we combined the control group that we had with a bright light group. Um, so during, it was the same simulated night shift protocol, but they, the participants were exposed to bright light uh, during the night. And again, we collected 24-hour uh, blood samples um, every two to four hours, right? and we measured melatonin, clock gene expression, and uh, transcriptomics analysis. So what we see here, so we look at the central clock, and unfortunately, due to technical issues, we only had uh, three participants, at least for the transcriptomic data that I will show uh, later. Um, but still, I think we were able to extract something meaningful from it, um, and we added to the control data that we already, uh, already showed. So what you can see is that the central clock measured by the melatonin midpoint shifted a lot in the bright light group and not uh, at all in the uh, in the control group. And also, if we look at peripheral clock genes um, measured in the blood samples, we see in the bright light group a large uh, a large shift. So this is baseline and this is um, night shift, and you can see a large uh, a large shift consistently for each of the uh, clock genes. So then what about the transcriptomes? So again, here I look, I look at the group level um, in the bright light group and the control group. And also at the level of the transcriptome, we can see large phase shifts in the bright light group and small phase shifts in the control group. Um, so suggesting that bright light not only has an effect on the central clock, uh, but also on peripheral clocks and also on the genes that are, um, that are controlled by these peripheral clocks. And also here, I looked at an individual level. So the top panel I already, I already showed. So in the control group, we see very uh, small phase shift in response to uh, the simulated night shift. But when it's combined with bright light, now all of a sudden the different transcripts, they show large uh, phase shift. So also suggesting on the individual um, level, we see a very big difference between the bright light group and the control group. Um, yeah, so suggesting that even after four days, these shifts are already, um, yeah, not only visible in the center clock, but also in the peripheral clock. So another thing I was very interested in is um, around the time I was uh, working on this, there were several publications on how to use a, uh, a single blood sample to predict central circadian phase from these gene expression levels that are in a single blood sample. And one method you can use uh, to study this is partial least squares regression. And so this method has been applied to uh, yeah, mainly healthy participants in um, yeah, sort of 
uh, yeah, so in, in sort of healthy conditions, so not uh, not shifted or no circadian misalignment. So our question was whether um, these methods, so to predict uh, central circadian phase from gene expression levels, also works um, after circadian misalignment or after a recent shift of the central clock. So using the data from uh, that I just showed, we applied this partial least squares regression. And what you can see here is the actual phase. So that's um, uh, used by or uh, calculated by melatonin and the predicted phase based on uh, the single uh, blood samples. And what you can see is that there's a, a clear correlation between this. And also if we compare the different groups, so this is the absolute error of the prediction. Um, so what's important, there's about a three hour absolute error on average, um, but there is no effect of, of group um, on this and no effect of condition. So that means that both in the, uh, uh, in the bright light group and in the control group, the central circadian phase can be predicted from a single uh, blood sample with equal uh, precision and accuracy. So then summarizing this, so do rhythms adapt in response to bright light? So yes, the central clock adapts, the peripheral clock um, adapts, and also a large part of the transcriptome adapts. And we haven't unfortunately been able to look at the metabolome here. Um, that will be a good next step. So then for the final part of my talk, I would like to move to a, a study we did in, um, in actual shift workers. So until now I've been showing you um, healthy participants, um, non-shift working participants, I should say. Um, and for the final part, I would like to discuss some results we obtained from a um, uh, yeah, from an, an population of actual shift workers. So this was part of a, a bigger field study that I won't discuss today, but we, um, so it was a field study in police officers and we convinced 11 of them to also participate in a laboratory study. Um, so what this consisted of is, um, the participants came into our lab after uh, they had been working, uh, I mean, evening shifts and they had some days off. Then they came into our lab for a 24 hour study visit. Um, they went, yeah, so they exited the lab again. They did a week of night shifts. So just as part of their regular job, they, as uh, police officers, they worked a week of night shifts. And then there was a second study visit of 24 hours um, scheduled now on a night shift schedule. So they slept. Uh, in our lab during the day, and they were awake, uh, yeah, during the previous night shifts. And so during these uh, these two study visits, we sampled frequent uh, urine samples. Um, yeah, and we so yeah, urine samples also, um, uh, and also a salivary or a saliva samples to measure cortisol, and oral mucosa samples to measure peripheral clock markers, um, and. Yeah, so based on this, we, um, we could also analyze the metabolism. So this was uh, also worked on by a PhD student in the lab. So she looked at, um, at the urinary 6 tophotoxin melatonin, so that's the metabolite of melatonin, um, as a marker for the central circadian clock. And what she saw is that there is um, a baseline, there is uh, a clear rhythm in 6 tophotoxin melatonin with a peak during the night. So as we would expect. And after shift work, you can see that this rhythm is dampened and also partially shifted. So now also after night shift work, the urinary six of toxic melatonin peaks uh, during the sleep period. And a similar thing was seen for uh, salivary cortisol. So normally cortisol peaks at wake time and is lower at bedtime. So that's what we saw at baseline uh, before shift work. And after working a week of uh, night shifts, now also cortisol peaks at wake time. So now it's 7 p.m. and was lower at bedtime around 11 a.m. So showing that the um, central circadian clock dampens but um, partially adapted in these chronic night shift workers. Um, yeah, so then um, she looked at um, uh, clock expression in oral mucosa. Um, or mucosa is another sort of peripheral tissue that you can uh, look at to see uh, clock gene expression rhythms. As you can see, there were nice rhythms at baseline, um, but these were mostly dampened, um, so there was no rhythm anymore 
uh, during night shift condition. So we cannot say much about whether they adapted or not, it was more blunted and uh, dampened. So then, yeah, we also looked at the uh, metabolome, so to see to what extent the uh, metabolite rhythms had, uh, had changed. And here are just some examples of these metabolites in, that we measured in urine. Um, yeah, so there were different examples. So here's, for example, a metabolite that showed a rhythm both before shift work and after shift work. And um, there were also metabolites that showed uh, a shifted rhythm after shift work compared to before shift work. Um, also metabolites that lost their rhythm or that um, had a, only a rhythm after shift work. So again, here also we use differential rhythmicity to classify these different metabolites. So in total, there were 79 metabolites and um, yeah, many of them show the rhythm in either of those conditions, but the effects were a bit mixed. So there were, um, yeah, there were more metabolites that show the rhythm during or before shift work compared to after, and some shifted and some remained rhythmic with similar, um, uh, yeah, that so remained rhythmic with a similar phase, so belonging to this phase. So if we visualize that here, you can see this change in peak timing in response to night shift work of these different metabolites. And what's very striking is that all metabolites that did not shift um, in response to night shift work, they were all acylcarnitins. So this is, this is a class of metabolites um, that reflect mitochondrial function. So they yeah, seem to remain, um, or they, yeah, they seem to be not so responsive to night shift and other metabolites, they did shift in response to, the, uh, to night shift. So now again, here's the overview. Um, yeah, so we see that the central clock partly adapts in actual night shift work, uh, but it's dampened, also peripheral clock is dampened. We were not able to look at the spectrum, unfortunately, um, and metabolome is a bit more uh, mixed. So that also shows the challenging nature of uh, doing field studies because the, uh, uh, yeah, of course there's more heterogeneity in the response compared to, um, uh, compared to laboratory studies. So, yeah, so then I come to the to the final slide of my talk. So just to wrap things up, um, yeah, I hope what I've shown is that night shifts uh, can lead to a state of misalignment between the human circadian transcriptome, the metabolome, and the external environment. Um, and these affected biological processes, uh, they may be implicated in the adverse health effects linked to long-term night shift work, um, with future research is, uh, is required to look into that. Um, and I think what's also very interesting to look at and what should be taken into account also in future studies is the friability in the individual responses to night shift. Um, for example, there might be a role of chronotype, so we were not able to look into that or other factors that determine the uh, inter-individual friability. Um, yeah, so with that, I would like to thank all the people that were involved in this work. So. Um, yes, I said all this work was uh, done at the uh, at McGill University in the laboratory of Diane Braffin and Nicolas Sermakian, um, and also the people I currently work for and the funding sources. Uh, I'm very grateful to. Yeah, so with that, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Laura, for this nice talk, especially the individual um, results I thought were really interesting. Um, we already have some questions in the chat, please feel free.